God's grace, mercy, and peace to you from Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, the basis for our meditation this morning on our second Sunday of Easter is from the 32nd verse of chapter 5 of our first reading, Acts 5, where we heard read, We are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the faithful witnesses of the apostles and uh, everyone, everyone in every generation since then who's brought to us this saving faith. Lord, we pray that as we live in this community and the world in which uh, we're surrounded and influenced by, that we too would be that faithful kind of witness to the glory of your holy name. It's in that holy name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, he is risen. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, do we have anybody here? Uh, last night we had a few people that make lists, you know, take, make lists and you kind of check them off when you get things done. I do sometimes, but probably not often enough. And as I get older, it's probably a better idea for me. I've got some kind of mental ideas of what I need to do, but uh, I, I raise that question for you list makers and those of us who may or may not do that. If we had made a list of things we wanted to get done in the last couple of months as a congregation, uh, as we gather together at Mount Olive Lutheran Church to prepare for Easter, uh, we could be checking things off that we, we got done over the last couple of months. Seven weeks of midweek Lenten services. Check. We got that done. Ten commandments reviewed. Check. We've got that finished. Easter celebrations, Easter breakfast, and all the services. Well, we had only had two services, but we got that done. Check. Well, we, well, we can't forget confirmation, the Palm Sunday, and the seven confirmants that were confirmed. Check. We got that done. Well, I don't know about you. When you check off things on your list and you, you're all done, maybe you sit back and go, great. Life can get back to normal. Well, as Christians, I want to suggest this morning as we check things off our list in, in the spiritual area of our life that that is not at all what we want to happen as we continue to celebrate Easter. Because hopefully, not just looking back as I preached last Sunday as spectators, but as people by faith firsthand having witnessed this miracle, hopefully Easter has made a difference in all of our lives and it has transformed everything about who we are and that in reality this truth changes everything about who we are. Our text from John chapter 20 tells us, He is risen so that by believing you and I may have life in his name. Verse 31, the very last phrase in our text for this morning. The key word as I read that is believing. If there is not true believing, there is not true life. There can be religious activity, all kinds of religious activity, which we just check off list of things that we should do religiously. There can be a sort of piety. There can even be a zeal and an enthusiasm, checking things off that appear to be right. But at their core, there is not resurrected life that can withstand the trials and temptations that are bound to come. That whole phrase that I just laid upon you is centered around the idea of believing. You see, Satan and all the demons of hell believe that Easter really happened. If anybody knows that it happened, Satan does. He saw everything that he had worked for crumbling. And so they believe in the historical event. But true belief, as Christians, faith-filled belief, is not simply acknowledging a historical event. It's much more than that. In fact, it's something impossible for us to do on our own. You see, we can read all the books we want about Christianity. We can debate all the doctrines that have divided Christians for centuries. Yet without one important reality, 
None of this will change our life, regardless of how enthusiastic we are about observing them, about debating them, about going through the motions of celebrating them even. Well, the reality that I'm speaking of is highlighted in our first reading today. And before I read it again, in preparation for this message this morning, the thought occurred to me as I reflected upon these texts and upon my own faith, Adrian, how can you be so sure? What gives you such confidence that this really happened? You act as if you were there. And obviously, you weren't. All those who were alive back then have long since died. Well, the answer is in our text. Let me read it for you again. It says, We are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. There are three witnesses here. They're presented in this order. First, the disciples who were physically present and encountered Jesus as we heard in the upper room. Not just once, but repeatedly after the resurrection. The second is the Holy Spirit who was clearly involved and actively present. And then there is this final group of witnesses. This final group of witnesses as I read this text, I suggest to you, compromises the same authentic, confident witnesses as the original first disciples. It is interesting to me how the writer of Acts presents them. There are two forces at play here. Obviously, the most important force is God, the Holy Spirit. But God always works through means, through something or someone. That's how he's always worked. And those he works through in this text are, quote, those who obey him, end quote. The last phrase of that Acts reading says, God has given the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. Obedience and faith go hand in hand. Believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, gives us life in his name. But that life has fruit. Martin Luther, over and over again in his sermons, and if you would read them, they're easily available. If you would read through his sermons, he would talk to his parishioners 500 years ago that if you have faith, there is obedience. If we're not obeying him and we say we have faith, we deceive ourselves. God reveals himself to us through his holy word, leading us to follow him in obedience. Satan and all the hosts of hell do not obey God in any way, shape, or form. They believe he exists, but the last thing they're going to do is obey him. And so the faith that I'm talking about in the scriptures point us to this morning are faith that believes and obeys. God has demonstrated his love for us so that our obedience is not in order to get him to love us more, as if that was possible. It's impossible for God to love us any more than sending his son to die on the cross and to rise again. There's nothing more that God could do. We obey him simply in response to his love. Think about doing things for those whom you love. If something is important to them, even though it may not interest you, you do it. You taste it. You experience it, right? And so as we look at God, if the Ten Commandments are important to God, they're important to us too. Even though obedience is far from perfect in our life, we set our mind and our hearts to obey Him in response to His love. Our salvation is secure in Christ Jesus, not in how well we do in obeying God's commandments. Well, as I contemplated this Acts text for this morning, it's interesting to me that it is this type of person that our text points out as the ones to whom God gives the Holy Spirit as witnesses. As you think about that, if we say that I'm a Christian and the public are, are watching this or a friend and we're trying to debate 
theological points, that's not going to win them to Christ. But if they see a life transformed, they're going to listen. If, if they, and people know intuitively what the Ten Commandments are, they may not have memorized them in catechism class with the explanations, but if they see us disobeying the commandments and saying we're following Christ, they're going, you're, 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 you're misled. And so as I think about that, if I want to be a witness for Christ and I'm ignoring what he's asked me to do, our witness is compromised. And so in this text this morning, it says the type of witnesses that God fills with the Holy Spirit are those whose life is in obedience to him. Well, as I think about obeying him, as I prepared just this morning and thinking about this as Roger taught his uh, Bible class this morning, as I think about obedience, I came up with three words to start with F. The first thing as we obey God that is important to him is to have faith in his son. The second thing is forgiveness. As we look to his son, we receive his forgiveness, repenting of our sins. And the third F is to follow him. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they, what? They follow me. Well, witnesses obviously are not perfect people. But their focus is on the one who is perfect in every way. Their desire to, is to follow him and to obey his lead as he guides them throughout their life. They don't do it perfectly. And if they make a mistake, like everybody else does, they get up again, repent of their sins, receive God's forgiveness, and live by the Holy Spirit's power to overcome sin in their lives. I've seen this time and time and time again because God's Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead has the same power to set you and me and anyone who confesses and believes in Christ to be set free from bondage to sin. The Holy Spirit always points us to Jesus. And because Jesus' death and resurrection are real life events, they make a dramatic difference in your life and mine. We then, by God's grace, are firsthand witnesses of God's resurrection power because his life caused us to experience this miracle of being, as our text says, born again and given a living hope. Think about it. Think about the time that the reality, not just the intellectual agreement of the truth, but the reality of your sins being forgiven. As the impact of the Ten Commandments struck a chord in your life and you realize, I'm guilty before God. And as a result of that guilt, I deserve to be eternally separated from Him. But rather than me suffer the consequences for my sin, Jesus stepped in. And seeing that love of God manifest through Christ Jesus cause us to fall at his feet in repentance and say, thank you, God. I don't ever want to do that again. Restore unto me the faith that you have given me and the life that you intended for me to live so that I may be an honor to your name and be a true faithful witness of the power of the resurrection. I pray that all of us here this morning have felt God's power as the spiritual ground under your feet has been shaken by his redeeming love and the reality of his cleansing presence that gives you the confidence to say no to sin and yes to God's righteousness. Not thinking that somehow we can do it perfectly because that's not the goal. Jesus did it perfectly and we look to him, point to him, and then follow him. Since that has happened, I pray in your life and, and it has in mine, life has never been back to normal. As if I can check that off my list and say, good, I can go back to my old way of doing things. No. As I said last week, maybe it was the... the first service, the Easter sunrise service, I said, Paul, looking at God's grace, said, said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he goes, heavens no, absolutely not. 
God has given us victory through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not only to have our sins forgiven, but to live in the freedom that God gives us where this shackles of sin has broken. The point on this second Sunday of Easter is Christ is risen so that we may have this kind of resurrection power in our life to the glory of his holy name as faithful witnesses. Amen?